I just want to tell you uh, originally what is currently legal in the state of Connecticut as far as gambling goes. We allow for tribal gaming, uh, the lottery, scratch off tickets, OTB, and Keno. And the amount of revenue that is generated from those individual things, from the tribes, in fiscal year 19, uh, the state received $203.6 million. And from the lottery court, uh, the state received $352.7 million. All of that money goes into the uh, general fund. Uh, so without further ado, I want to introduce our, our guest panel. Uh, to my left, and we're going to work down the table, is Andy Levinson. Andy has been a, at the PGA Tour since December 2004. He currently serves as the vice, Senior Vice President of Tournament and Administration. His responsibilities include all matters related to competitions and administration, policy, compliance, governance, and tournament standards. In December 2011, Levinson was appointed Executive Director of USA Golf Federation, the National Olympic Governing Body for Golf, overseeing all aspects of the men's and women's U.S. Olympic teams. He's originally from Richmond, Virginia. Levinson received his B.A. from Vanderbilt University in Nashville, Tennessee in 1996, and he currently resides in Florida with his wife Jennifer and sons Nathan and Henry. Uh, next up is Kenny Gersh. Uh, Mr. Gersh serves as the Executive Vice President of Gaming and New Bus Business Ventures for the Major League Baseball. In his role, Gersh oversees all business aspects of sports betting, data distribution, and fantasy games on behalf of the league. Gersh was responsible for the business activities of BAM Tech, which is the business uh, tech part of that, which provided video distribution services for dozens of clients, including the NHL, the PGA Tour, HBO, ESPN, WWE, Sony, PlayStation, View, and The Blaze. Gersh also serves on the Board of Stadium, a first of its kind live streaming network partnership involving multiple leagues and media properties. He holds a BS in Business Administration from Boston University and a JD from the University of Southern California Law Center. Corey Fox, he's the counsel for the policy and government affairs at FanDuel. In addition to heading up the FanDuel government affairs team, Corey also manages state compliance issues for FanDuel and advises the business on new products. Prior to his time at FanDuel, Corey was a senior policy counsel at the Entertainment Software Association. We advise the video game industry on telecom, privacy, and e-commerce issues. Corey holds a BA from the University of California, uh, Davis, and a JD from American University's Washington College of Law. Corey is based in Washington, D.C., where he lives with his wife and two daughters. Griffin Finnan uh, is counsel and head of government affairs for DraftKings and is overseeing all government affairs work for the company since 2015. Prior to DraftKings, he worked in private practice at a boutique firm in Washington, D.C., working with various clients in the gaming industry. Rich Pingle as the chief legal officer. He joined Sports Tech in August 2012 and oversees the legal, regulatory, contractual, and compliance affairs of the company's three main business divisions, as well as providing counsel to Sports Tech's PLC and its directors and executives. Rich is an accomplished attorney with over a decade of legal and business experience and significant acumen in the racing and gaming industries. So you can see we have uh, quite an accomplished panel this evening and how it will work. I'm going to turn the uh, podium over to my good friend, Representative Renju, to kind of talk about where we are in the state of Connecticut as far as uh, gambling goes, where we may be going in the future. And then we're going to allow each of our speakers to speak to three to five minutes and really open it up to the audience to hear uh, what questions you may have uh, as far as uh, sports game, sports betting does goes and online gambling. And we may throw some questions in there ourselves because we may be interested in some things um, if they're not covered by the audience members. So without further ado, I'd like to turn it over to Representative Renja. Uh, good evening and, and welcome. Uh, I see a lot of familiar faces and certainly want to thank our panel for taking the time to, to come out and uh, uh, discuss the issue of sports betting, uh, regardless of the size of, of the crowd, and, and we are being televised, which is a good thing. I, I think uh, whenever we have an opportunity to go out and meet the public and have this discussion and, and be transparent uh, is always a good thing, and, and hopefully for those of you who are, are new to this discussion, um, you'll leave uh, a bit more informed than when you got here. Uh, I'd like to start off, and I'll talk briefly, but I think it's important, before we just talk about sports betting, I think it's important to take a step back, and, and this is what I've done in, in the past session, is to take a step back and look at our overall gaming policy. Sports betting is a small piece of a bigger picture, and, and our gaming policy is at a crossroads. If you ask me, I would say it's antiquated, in the sense that 
we have an agreement, a long-standing agreement, uh, with our tribal friends uh, in, in the form of a compact. The compact was negotiated over 30 years, and as many of you know, since then, uh, the gaming landscape has changed, uh, not only here in Connecticut, but in our neighboring states. It's become much more competitive. And if Connecticut wants to remain competitive in the gaming industry, then um, I think that we need to move forward in a number of areas. And I don't want to spend a, a lot of time talking about the casinos, but um, from a job standpoint and a revenue standpoint, uh, casinos are definitely a priority going forward. One of the struggles that we have here in Connecticut, unlike other states, is the compact. We have, a, again, we have this 30-year 30 30 year compact with our tribal friends, and in return for giving them exclusivity on their tribal reservation, the state receives a 25% tax, if you will, on slot machines. 30 years ago, and, and maybe even 15 years ago, um, the deal that we had with the tribes was very lucrative. Brought in approximately, at one, at one point, over $400 million to the state of Connecticut. Now, with competition in Springfield, uh, MGM Casino opening in, in Springfield, and soon to be a Boston Casino, that figure it will be down to less than $200 million. Still a lot of money, but nevertheless, a lot less value than it was many years ago. Which brings us to the point of how do we compete going forward? Again, not only in the casino business, but in sports betting. The tribes have publicly uh, indicated that they have exclusivity when it comes to sports betting as well. It seems that every turn, whether we talk about keno, sports betting, or any type of betting in the state of Connecticut, we have to deal and negotiate with our tribal friends. So uh, recent press reports have said that, oh, the state of Connecticut should just do sports betting, vote on it, flip a switch, and it's going to happen tomorrow. That's certainly not the case. Even if we were to agree with the tribes or some other stakeholders that I'll mention in a minute, uh, that process would take a long time, many, many months. So again, um, what, what, what I'm advocating for is let's take a step back, we'll go into a new session, and we'll, we'll, we'll uh, do a, uh, come out with a comprehensive policy with gaming, which includes casinos, sports betting. I'm going to now just take a few minutes to, to focus on why we're here for this evening, sports betting. In every conversation that I've had, and many of the representatives are here this evening, I've always included the various stakeholders, obviously including the public and those who are anti-gaming. Um, it's important that they have uh, a seat at the table as well. But in all the conversations that I've had, I think it's important uh, to include all the stakeholders. Who are the stakeholders? Obviously, our casinos, whether it be the tribal casinos, the possibility of a commercial casinos, our OTBs, sports tech, and our very successful uh, Connecticut State Lottery. So who's going to run sports betting? Those are the questions um, that need to be answered. Is it, is it a mix of all those entities that I described, or is it something different? But here, here's why I've called um, for a uh, comprehensive review, and as part of that comprehensive review, called to have a consultant assist our legislature in dealing with these issues. No better point than this. Let's just say that all those entities I just described were to have a piece in sports betting. Or let's just say we would eliminate, and I'm just saying this for the sake of conversation, uh, the OTBs. They're no longer in the conversation. By making a simple decision like that, there's a financial impact to the town or, or to the state. Or if we eliminate the lottery from the discussion, there's a financial impact. So before we make any of these decisions, we have to understand the financial impact to the state of Connecticut, which is why I believe because we're part-time legislators, that it would be a good idea to work with a consultant. 
not have a study, but work with somebody in the industry who's assisted other legislatures. The issue with sports betting, one of the challenges um, that we had, and I believe what was at the heart of the national debate when it came to sports betting, was the issue of the leagues asking for an integrity fee. Uh, integrity fee is described in, in many different ways, um, but uh, I will say that uh, the initial thought, or from what I gathered from the leagues, and you're going to hear from them, and they could probably describe it a little bit better than, than I can in all fairness, was that they were going to, um, or they, they wanted a percentage of the overall bet. So however much money spent a month on a in the state of Connecticut on sports betting, that a percentage of that would go to the leagues as in quote unquote uh, integrity fee. I say that's at the heart of the national debate because again, depending on which states either have passed sports betting bills or on the process or looking at it, um, st different states um, go different ways. But I believe in working with the leagues, we created something very special because I advocated at one time at the end of the session um, for a sports betting bill because I thought we had a window of opportunity to not necessarily give the leagues an integrity fee or write a check out to them at the end of the month, but let's, not, let's change the conversation. I don't want to call it an integrity fee. Let's build a partnership. And we all kind of looked at each other and like, what, what are you talking about? What, what's a partnership? A partnership might look like, and this was included in the bill, is that we have many empty arenas uh, or fields that are empty, as I just said. Let's see, if we, let's see how we can fill those arenas and build a partnership to build the league's base here in the state of Connecticut, as well as, as, well as having some economic activity as a result of partnering with the leagues. So for example, have an NBA game at the Hartford Civic Center, have an exhibition NFL game at Rental Field, whatever, whatever it may be or whatever it may look like, but at least the state of Connecticut will have, there'll be a presence in the leagues, will have a presence here, continue to have a presence here, and it'll generate some economic t activity. I believe that model, and they'll correct me if I'm wrong, um, was one of the first in the nation to, to have that conversation. So as we move forward, um, uh, that we'll continue to have that conversation. Not sure what the model's gonna look like, sports betting, but I will say this, and I'm sure the, the good senator would agree, that going into the next session, uh, uh, gaming in general, and particularly sports betting, will be on our front burners. Thank you. Thanks, Joe. So why don't we just go start over here, and uh, with Andy, go down and spend uh, five minutes talking about your industry a little bit. Um, uh, I'll describe that if you want to refer to the, uh, the fee that Joe was talking about or where, what you've seen what's going on in other states. And then once everybody's concluded that, we'll open up to the audience for any questions or, and we'll feed some in if there's none from the audience. Great. Thanks, Ian. Well, good evening. I'd like to first thank Senator Whitcoast and Representative Rengia for having us. It's great to be in Hartford, home of the Travelers Championship, which is one of the very best tournaments on the PGA Tour. Uh, the PGA Tour started really focusing on gaming, uh, when I say gaming, I mean betting on our sport, about two years ago when we started to notice an uptick in the activity and interest in betting on golf internationally, in the legal international regulated markets. And what we focused on at that time was how, how to protect the integrity of our competition and the perception of our sport. Uh, globally and and one of the things we focused on was was creating some rules and regulations in-house uh, creating an integrity program which uh, puts parameters on our athletes and all of our constituents whether they be caddies or employees or tournament staff uh, sports agents everybody who is in the world of the PGA Tour and involved with putting on a competition and putting some rules in place uh, that says this activity is going on, it's fine that it's going on, but we want to we want to make sure that everything that's taking place on the field of competition is the very best efforts of the athletes and our consumers can rest assured that what they see on television or in person is the real deal. 
So, so that's the first thing we did, and we established that about a year and a half ago. And then uh, late last year, it became obvious that the Supreme Court was going to uh, consider uh, the current federal legislation or, or the, the, the federal legislation on sports betting and revisit that issue in, in, a, in a case with the state of New Jersey. And as, as oral arguments were heard, it became increasingly obvious to our advisors that it looked like the court was going to uh, strike down uh, or rule that the current, or the, at the time, the current federal uh, prohibition on sports betting was going to be unconstitutional. And that would open it up to the states to decide uh, whether or not they wanted to allow sports betting or not. And at that moment, we felt like we needed to get involved in the conversation. We wanted to have our voices heard because, as I said earlier, the, 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 the integrity of our competition is really fundamental to our sport. We're a sport where the athletes actually call rules violations against themselves in competition. So it's extremely important to maintain that image of our sport. Uh, and you, you might ask, okay, how, how is that accomplished through legislation? Well, there's a number of ways that that can be done. Representative Varengia mentioned transparency. Transparency is extremely important in protecting integrity of sport. And that can be accomplished through, through sharing of betting information. So if the betting operators were to share all of the betting data with the operators, the regulators, and the leagues, then we could all have a holistic view of what's taking place. And I'll give you a, a, an example of how that could be exploited. Let's say someone places uh, a few bets in Connecticut, then gets in their car and they drive to New York, and then they get in their car and they drive to Pennsylvania. Well, one of those individual bets in and of itself might not raise a red flag. But if we had a more holistic view of what was taking place, then we might be able to recognize some sort of anomaly <coughs> And, and weed that out before any, any, anything untoward were to happen. So it's very important that we have transparency and the sharing of information, a free flow between the regulators, the operators, and the, the governing bodies that are putting on the competition. There also needs to be protections in place for consumers, whether that uh, is age restrictions or uh, you know, information for problem gamblers, and also some assurances to the, to the public that they know that what they're betting on is the real deal. And the leagues collect significant amounts of data, uh, statistics, and those, that information can be used in a positive way to engage fans even in the activities of sports betting. But what we've seen overseas internationally is that some groups and some betting operators uh, don't necessarily use official information and they're collecting information by sending operatives to sporting events and gathering data in that manner and that information isn't necessarily accurate or real time and so one of the things that we think is important in responsible legislation is the inclusion of a, a mandate for use of official league data particularly for betting that takes place during the competition. Um, another area that we're focusing on when we're talking about uh, sports betting legislation is the importance of mobile betting. So right now there is a massive black market in sports betting. Uh, there are very few states that have even to this point begun to allow sports betting. So most of the sports betting still is taking place uh, on illegal online sites or through local bookmakers or something like that. If, if mobile betting is allowed, or online betting, then a lot of that activity will just go away. That's what we've seen internationally, and we have no reason to expect that won't be the case here domestically as well. Um, so, so those are really the things that we're focusing on when we're trying to protect the integrity of our sport, protect our fans, and protect our consumers. Aside from that, we see sports betting as a, as a great positive. It's a great way to engage our fans. It's a great way to get the message of our sport out there, in particular for the PGA Tour. We see tremendous opportunity for fans to get to know our sport through that activity. And you know, we, 
we come to Hartford every year and uh, you know engage a lot of people in the community. We raise a lot of money through charity at all of the events that we do. And we see that this, this activity could actually help boost that. Uh, so we're all for it. All right, good job. Hi, I'm Kenny Gersh from Major League Baseball. Um, first, I'd like to thank the Senator and the Representative for having us all here today. And uh, as a resident of Connecticut myself, I'm actually really glad to see the amount of thought and, and you know, attention that they are each given to this issue so that Connecticut can maximize the opportunity that's in front of it, in front of them for all of us. So as a resident to, to generate some revenue in addition to being a representative of the league. Um, I think Andy did a, a good job of summarizing the points that we've been looking at in legislation also for data sharing, official data, mobile, some of the, the points that the representative touched on in his, uh, in his remarks as well. My role at baseball is on the commercial side for the most part. I recently took a position as we were moved into a position in, at baseball um, overseeing all the commercial aspects of sports betting for the league. So the things that I focus on um, are sort of three main areas. One, how, how do we protect the integrity of the game from the sort of threat of sports betting? It, in and of itself, I, as I'll get into in my next two points, I see it as a big opportunity for baseball. Um, but first, we have to protect our integrity. And what I mean by that is, Anything I do on the business side, I don't want there, it ever to lead to a situation where our fans feel like things are being manipulated on the field to play in a way that makes it no longer the game that they love. And, and we have so many moments, whether it's in golf uh, or baseball, where just incredible things happen on the field to play that you're like, oh my God, that couldn't have possibly happened. Like Tiger Woods is suddenly back in winning tournaments. Uh, you know, the Red Sox come back from 3 nothing to beat the Yankees and go on and win their, the World Series. I, we will always want to make sure that people still have that faith and trust that, that what they're seeing on the field is real and what's happening. Um, I, I think that's, I, I think we'll be fine and, and we'll be able to survive, but once you introduce sports betting in a more mainstream way, we just want to make sure that those lines are clear, that whatever we do to benefit from sports betting is not ever affecting the, the play on the field. So some of the things of using official data, us having some say in the bet types that the sports books are taking to be able to suggest that hey, maybe you shouldn't take a bet on whether the first pitch of the game is going to be a ball or a strike, because it's something that is hard to really tell if it's, if it's happening. Um, you know, if we're going to have betting on the home run derby, let's have some understanding that the home run derby is an exhibition and so things may not follow the the rules all the way and just because someone's betting on it I don't want to change the enjoyment of that event for the fans seeing Bryce Harper hit home runs in his home stadium of, of you know Nationals Park was was a great exciting moment for everyone people were betting on it and had some complaints as to how it worked but at the end of the day it wasn't meant to be a betting event and we would like to have had some say in in how that was presented um, the, the other part of that in maintaining the integrity both of, of the sport and of the betting markets is to do things that move the illegal markets to the legal markets. So Andy touched on that. I'm sure these guys have touched on it as well. That we're all in the same boat there, that to the extent sports betting is happening, we want to make sure that it happens in a legal regulated way, both for the fans' protection and, and for the protection of the, the sport and for the protection of the state so that the revenue that's being generated by this is flowing through the proper channels. The next thing I focus on is how do we use, once we protect baseball or the other sports from the sort of threats of sports betting, how do we use it as an opportunity and how do we use it as an engagement vehicle for fans to get them more involved in what is happening on the field? Um, so anything that obviously creates more interest in the sport is, is good for us and, and you know hopefully is good for the fans. Without our involvement so far, it, it hasn't really happened, at least in baseball. So the legal markets that exist in Nevada, the illegal markets that happen around the world, the legal markets that happen in Europe, betting on baseball hasn't been a great experience. It's a very confusing market where it's Red Sox plus 140, and then I don't know if that means the Red Sox are favored or they're the underdog, and what do, how much do I bet to win, and what's really happening in this? So we don't think it's been a good user experience for the fan uh, without our involvement. We think by us sort of leaning in, sort of embrace, embracing the fact that betting is happening and it can be used to, to enhance our fans' enjoyment of the game, there's a lot of things we can do. So what are we doing? 
Um, one is we've already spent a lot of time and effort in collecting the data that happens on the field. So not just a matter of, you know, the Red Sox scored, they're beating the Yankees three to two. You'll thought and note an obvious bias in, in my presentation, but that's gonna that's gonna continue throughout. Hopefully we're in the right part of Connecticut that that we're all on the same page here. But um you know, we, we've invested a lot in the field, what we call stat cast and pitch cast, actually track the arc of the ball when it leaves the pitcher's hand until it crosses the plate. And, you know, not only just the speed, but the break and the movement on it and what's happening, tracking the players as they're moving around the field. So when it looks like Jackie Bradley made just an unbelievable catch, it, in Jackie's case, it probably is, but we can actually track that. Like, what was the catch probability? He had an 18% uh, chance of catching that and sort of use that to tell the story. Um, launch angle has been a new metric that we've done, and you know, when, when JD Martinez hits the ball, really, how how much harder did he hit it than Aaron Judge has hit it? Um, and and that all we've used over the years to create more of a story of what's happening on the field. The next evolution in that is to now take that data that we collect and create the very best data feed for betting. And what that means is so that instead of just betting that the Red Sox are going to beat the Yankees, we can bet on all the discrete events that happen within a baseball game. So when Mookie Betts comes up to bat, you can bet something we, we are toying with called sort of base buster bomb. So what are the odds that he's going to get on base, whether it's a hit or an error or a walk? Um, whether he's going to get an out by any means or if he's going to hit a home run. And there'll be different odds on each of those outcomes. It'll be something that you can bet five bucks on and win seven or bet five and win ten, depending on the, uh, you know, what, what the game situation is and the particular odds of him doing it. So by using our data and investing in our data, we think we can create more engaging ways for people to, to bet on baseball and to enjoy baseball as opposed to it just being this sort of esoteric, you know, money line or run line that's hard to that's hard to understand. As part of that, we're also going to invest in building products. Um, and we're probably going to, we'll obviously never be a sports book or take the bets. So we'll leave that to, to these guys and others. Um, but we want to sort of create some free to play games and, and sort of emulate what sports betting could be and what an engaging fan game could be. And something that you can play against your friends and something that you can play in sort of every state, whether betting is legal or not. But that in the states where betting is illegal, hopefully Connecticut, we can you know, leverage it to use with the licensed operators in the state to create more compelling games. So those are the first two things, protect the integrity, increase the engagement. And the third is revenue. And, you know, something that was, that was mentioned earlier, but revenue is important to all of us. We want to increase the amount of revenue that sports books or the casinos or the lottery, whoever's running it in the state, is making by the things that I talked about earlier, the data feeds and the products, so that there's more revenue to go to the state and generate revenue and provide better services for me in Connecticut. Um, and, and then also for the league. Um, you know, we do feel that, that there's both a fairness in, in the state granting a license to a particular entity to allow them to do sports betting, which is based on our sports and golf and others. We think it, there's fair for all three of us to sh sort of share that revenue. And to make that point clear, and the representative said earlier about it being a partnership, we're not looking to come in and say there would have been $100 bet on, on baseball this year, and we're just going to take a cut of it. We're going to increase that handle from all the things I said earlier by, by leaning in and investing and sort of using our marketing power to show who the legal bookmakers are versus the illegal market. We're going to increase the amount of revenue that's generated and hopefully have more for all of us to share than it would have been without our involvement. And then also there's the incentive, which goes hand in hand in that, that if at the end of the day we're economic entities, so if we're incentivized to help increase the amount of sports betting, legal sports betting that happens in the state of Connecticut, we're going to use our power and our leverage and our assets to do that, which again hopefully will lead to a better experience for all of us. So that's the way we're looking at it. I look forward to taking some questions at the end. And in the meantime, I'll pass it down. Thank you. I want to hear more about StatCast, but instead I'll talk a little bit about FanDuel. Uh, thank you, Senator Wickos and Representative Beringia for having us. I thought I'd give a little bit of background about FanDuel, um, talk about where we are. So FanDuel was founded in 2009 as a fantasy sports company. Fantasy sports have obviously been around since the early 80s, but the big innovation for FanDuel was to shorten the contest so they were a week or a day, and to really focus on doing it on the mobile phone. Seems like not that long ago, but you know, in 2009 the iPhone was pretty new, and so 
bring fantasy sports onto the mobile phone was really critical and a critical innovation at that point and important for what we want to talk about here tonight. So uh, FanDuel grew from 2009, but really started to take off in 2012. 2015, you may have seen a couple of our ads alongside <laughs> DraftKings if you watch any football whatsoever. Um, and we definitely heard about that quite a bit. Uh, fortunately, in 2016 and 2017, my phone's just buzzing to say the Dodgers won the NL West title, for those of you interested. Um, I'm a San Francisco Giants fan, so it's bad news. Uh, <laughs> fortunately, in 2016 and 2017, uh, we were able to pass laws in nearly 20 states clarifying the legality of fantasy sports, including Connecticut, with an important caveat that we can talk about later. Our players were really instrumental in passing those bills. Players love fantasy sports because they love to engage with sports. People want to be on their phones, they want to be thinking about what's going to happen next, they, they love the sporting experience. And we want to make sports more exciting. So we currently operate fantasy sports in 41 states. So just as fantasy sports law was becoming settled, as we were just discussing last May, the Supreme Court struck down PASPA, uh, paving the way for all states to offer legal sports betting. This obviously seems like a natural extension of those things we were doing on cell phones to make sports more exciting and more engaging. Um, so we immediately started thinking about this opportunity. And by July, two things had happened. So the Supreme Court struck down PASPA in May. By July, FanDuel had merged with Patty Power Betfair with, with the US assets of Patty Power Betfair, which is one of the largest sports books in the world. And we'd also opened the, one of the first physical retail sports books in New Jersey at the Meadowlands right next to MetLife Stadium and the closest sports book to Manhattan. Um, we're now merged with Patty Power Betfair, which also means that we are in the FanDuel group, which owns TVG, the horse racing network, and an ADW platform, as well as Betfair Interactive, which runs a casino in New Jersey. So we, we gained quite a bit of uh, experience and knowledge about how to operate a, a betting platform and how to operate sports betting as Patty Power does around the world, mostly in Europe and Australia. Um, as Connecticut looks at sports betting, I, I think you know these points have already been hit, but really we think that mobile sports betting is critical and it's the only way to get one of the best benefits of legalizing sports betting, which is eradicating illegal sports betting, so that whatever the negative externalities of illegal sports betting are, including integrity concerns that may exist, uh, responsible play issues that may exist, we're able to bring those out into a regulated market and also that states like Connecticut can share in the revenues we were just discussing. So we're, we're expanding quickly. We also opened up a physical sports book in West Virginia at the Greenbrier Resort a few weeks ago, and we're hoping to get our app running in West Virginia shortly, and there are a few other states looking at it, some of them very close to here, like Pennsylvania and New York. So we're excited about the opportunity to discuss this here in Connecticut. And with that, I'll turn it over to Griffin. Thank you, Corey, and, and thank you, uh, Representative Varengia and Senator Wittkos, for the opportunity to participate today and for hosting the forum. Um, DraftKings is a Boston-based sports entertainment company. We now have more than 100,000 players here in the state of Connecticut. Uh, we were launched in 2012 with the goal of bringing sports fans closer to the games they love. You know, just a few years after FanDuel. Same, similar business model. And two that, since 2012, we really experienced pretty rapid growth, driven in large part by our mobile platform. Uh, we now have over 10 million customers globally playing fantasy sports. And just recently, we became the first mobile sports wagering app outside the state of Nevada when we launched in New Jersey. Uh, since our inception, 19 states, including Connecticut, have passed laws to confirm the legality of fantasy sports and to put in place some common sense consumer protections. Uh, we look forward to working closely with members of the legislature here and finding a sports betting framework that protects consumers, allows for the mobile sports wagering market to continue to flourish, and generate significant revenue for the state while stamping out the black market. And while fantasy sports and sports betting are wholly different activities, the smart regulations Connecticut and many other states have applied successfully to the fantasy sports can create a roadmap for a safe, strong regulatory structure for online sports betting. For example, the online age verification process used by fantasy operators is in many ways more comprehensive than the in-person verification used at casinos. At DraftKings, we use Know Your Customer technology. It ensures that underage players are not able to deposit money or play on the site. 
Um, and the reality is that sports betting is occurring online right now and at a significant level. I know others have touched on it earlier on the panels, but we have studies, or there's been studies by the American <coughs> Gaming Association and by Ernst & Young that have found that more than 750,000 Connecticut residents are currently betting illegally on sports online. And that's to the tune of more than 1.5 million in bets annually. There are other experts, Eilers and Krejcik, who are gaming consultants, project that if legalized sports betting is offered only at Connecticut's casinos with no online, online options, the illegal market would continue to thrive and then more than half a million Connecticut residents would continue to simply play illegally online. Um, not only would those online options help to end the black market, that the state would then see a greater benefit. According to Oxford Economics, including online sports betting, would more than double the estimated gross gaming revenue in the state, from 130 million for casino-only sports betting to almost 300 million by adding online options. As Connecticut continues to explore a legal and regulated sports betting market for the state, DraftKings is happy to share its experience as a regulated online and mobile platform and look forward to participating. Thank you very much. Thanks, Adam. Uh, thank you, Senator Whitgos, Representative Varengia, for, for having us out. My name is Rich Pingle. I'm the Chief Legal Officer for Sport Tech PLC. We are a, uh, a, a British company. We're traded on the London Stock Exchange. And we offer wagering products on a business-to-business -business and also a business-to-consumer basis. We operate in 37 countries. Here in the U.S., we have a presence in 37 of the states. Uh, we have a special relationship with the state of Connecticut in that we operate the off-track betting system. We're the exclusive and perpetual operators uh, of the paramutual wagering system here in the state. Uh, we have been, uh, for the past 25 years, uh, been a partner with the state in operating that system, also with the Department of Consumer Protection. We work closely with them. So we bring a, a little bit more of the hands-on experience here in the state, uh, dealing with a lot of the issues that uh, fellow panelists have raised. Uh, so I feel we, we bring some, some good experience there from, from actually operating uh, in the state of Connecticut. I'm joined tonight by Ted Taylor, our, our president of Sport Tech Venues, which is the uh, division in Connecticut that operates our off-track betting network. Uh, we currently have 16 facilities in the state branded as winners. And we also have an online digital platform called mywinners.com, which is an advanced deposit wagering for paramutual. So for those that aren't familiar with that, that's betting on horses or greyhounds, high lie, handful of other paramutual or pool betting products, uh, which is, is what Sportech's uh, primary business line is. With regard to Connecticut, we also have our American operations and headquarters in New Haven. Uh, we employ over 400 people in the state, uh, and we oversee our operations as far north as Canada, down to South America, the Caribbean, etc., uh, out of New Haven. So, obviously, Sport Tech believes in Connecticut. We've made uh, significant advancements and investments here in the state. Uh, we're excited to continue doing that uh, with the legalization of sports betting. We're thrilled to be part of the conversation. We're thrilled to be part of the consideration of, of operators here in the state. Uh, we think we bring the right mix. Uh, the panelists have, have brought up some of, some of the issues that are uh, key and, and on the forefront in these discussions. We've been having these discussions with our legislative leadership, with the governor's office. Um, we've held a, a series of educational seminars and sessions to try to help that process along. We think we've We've been re relatively successful in doing that, uh, helping to lead those conversations and participate in the process. One of the important pieces, in addition to the consumer safeguards, the, the know your customers, uh, regulations, anti-money laundering is another thing that, that needs to be considered, age verification, uh, is, is that there needs to be also, in addition to just an online platform, there needs to be a retail distributorship. So there needs to be opportunity for consumers in the state to both visit a location and or to participate on a mobile platform. So I think that's an important consideration when we're talking about how are we going to roll out sports betting, how are we going to combat this black market that's out there that's 
estimated. The, the numbers are everywhere, but the number that we rely on is that there's $600 million in illegal wagers annually coming out of Connecticut. So in order to combat those uh, illegal operators who are set up offshore, who don't pay taxes, who don't employ people within the state of Connecticut, who aren't subject to oversight by the Department of Consumer Protection, we need to make sure that we're putting in place a system that allows operators uh, to successfully compete against them to offer a product that will be enticing to consumers to move them off the illegal sites and it needs to be something that makes sense and is easy to use. So when we were gearing up for sports betting, uh, we vetted a lot of different companies and, and we are very satisfied that we've chosen one of the world leaders, uh, a company called Sport Radar, uh, which is one of the uh, largest betting data providers and also risk management services uh, available to sports books out there. Uh, they service pretty much every bet that you'll see out there, uh, you know, in European jurisdictions, uh, worldwide. They are the data point for over a thousand clients out there. So when we were looking to build out our platform to expand from paramutual into sports betting, we we're looking for someone with that pedigree and we're, we're very pleased that we've announced that uh, partnership back in May. One of the other unique features in this discussion uh, around integrity fees is that Sport Radar uh, is one of the leaders in league and foundation integrity monitoring and compliance. And what that means is uh, Sport Radar is actually the, uh, the company that many leagues will hire, including NHL, including Major League <coughs> Soccer, etc. And what they do is they monitor the game. Uh, so if there was any suspicious play, they're monitoring that. But they're also monitoring the the betting trends, as was mentioned by a fellow panelist, that if there is suspicious betting, what they'll do is they'll flag that match and suspend the match. So they're doing a lot of that work already for the leagues. Um, so in that regard, we're, we're pleased to come forth to the market with Sport Radar. I think their pedigree combined with Sportex uh, is, is really a solid offering. I think we would have the retail distribution within the state uh, and also the online expertise uh, to really make a success of it and to maximize the revenues and to make sure that when we do offer this, it's the right mixture, that we're combating the, the markets and that we're properly regulated. Uh, as Representative Varengia said in his opening remarks, there is quite a bit of lead time. So even when the legislature does decide, and hopefully it's in early 2019, that we move forward with this, there is going to be a significant amount of regulation licensing, review of uh, product and platform that will have to happen. So uh, again, having the familiarity with the state uh, over a quarter century's experience here in Connecticut, Sportec itself is, is celebrating its, uh, its 100 year anniversary uh, as well. So we, we've been in the space, we understand the space, we think it's important that the state consider the operators that are coming forth, where they want to uh, entrust this opportunity. Uh, and how they think it should should properly be rolled out. Um, so I, I won't drone on. I have uh, comments that I can offer on integrity fees and whatnot. Uh, the primary one being the important distinction when we hear the leagues talk about the integrity fees is that sports betting is a, is a risk market, and that's even different from what we do in paramutual wagering, where it's it's pool wagering. So where the money that comes in gets distributed out to the folks that have entered the market. With sports betting, there is a risk element, and it's the operators, so the, the folks that are taking the bets, that are making the markets, that are absolving that risk. So when we talk about integrity fees, some of the models that have been put forward uh, really take a lion's share of the profits uh, and turn them over to the leagues. And while we think the leagues produce a great product and we want to see that the integrity is maintained as well, I think really the discussion is about the data uh, itself. Because certainly the leagues have prevailed through the markets that are out there now. It's a, a huge black market out there uh, in sports betting. There's legalized markets in Vegas that have, have been out there. And to my knowledge, the, the leagues have done a great job of maintaining the integrity of the game. So I think it actually moves in a different direction once we start regulating this, once we start looking at it, once we start putting partners in play that have the skill to actually provide those services, that the integrity fees minimize, not increase. 
because currently you have off track, or not off track, excuse me, offshore bookies taking bets uh, illegally with no oversight, uh, no restrictions whatsoever. So if ever there was an argument that someone were to try to influence a game or an athlete, uh, I don't see how that increases in a regulated market with regulated operators and uh, regulated tools in place. So I think the leagues do have a place at the table. I think it's more <laughs> likely to be. So too, since it's our game. It's, it's more likely to be in the in the marketplace with regard to the the licensing or the the data rights, the official data, and and we just saw the NBA entered into a, a, an agreement uh, similar to that. But I don't think the place for doing that is in the is in the state house. I don't think that integrity fees need to be built into legislation. I think the market will take care of that itself. Um, I think the leagues have done a great job with it, and I do think there's a, a room there for, for data feeds. And if there were to be integrity fees built into the, the legislative package that the, the state were to adopt, I think there should be some sort of tie back to the operators, because again, the operators have the risk uh, of the lack of integrity and also the operators need to get that data to ensure the integrity. So I think that needs to be added to part of that discussion to the extent that uh, integrity fees were to go forward. Um, but I'll, I'll close my remarks there and, and turn over the table. Uh, Senator Wickos, thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. You know, it kind of reminds me of a, um, the beginning of a Star Trek episode where you're going to explore the unknown because uh, just sitting here as somebody who may be discussing and working on some policy issues next year as a million questions that come to my mind when we talk about integrity fees, what percentage, who gets it, does it breach the exclusivity compact, do we have to negotiate with the tribes, um, you know, the Office of Fiscal Analysis, which is what the independent nonpartisan agency that legislators rely on for data, has stated that uh, if we do um, pass legislation legalizing online gambling and sports betting, it would generate about $40 million and additional revenue to the state of Connecticut, but they couldn't give us a number as to how much betting is done in the black market. So it's, for me, it was kind of hard to, how do you get that number over here if you can't find the number it's being derived from? And I heard figures of 340 million, 600 million, so it's all over the place. And we'd like to see, um, you know, learn from New Jersey. They were the first one out of the, out of the off the track, I guess, if you will, for getting sports betting. And uh, we definitely could be looking forward to it. But this is your opportunity to ask questions. Um, I know Joe and I probably have a lot of questions. But uh, from audience members, if you'd like to question uh, to the panel, just stand up and uh, please ask your questions. I'm told, come to the microphone so they can collect it on uh, the TV. It, can, I, can I address some of the comments that were made at both sure, let's, let's give the audience members a couple of sure. You can, maybe okay. you can address it in your comments. Anybody? Uh, Eric? Good evening. My name is Eric Wellman. I'm the first selectman of uh, Simsbury. Uh, thank you for being here, and um, I, I appreciate the conversation because, as a general rule, I believe that we don't make things uh, safer and better by banning it. We make it safer and better by legalizing and regulating it. So I appreciate the senator and representatives' uh, work on this issue. My uh, question for this group is, as you look at other models, uh, be they uh, domestically or abroad, uh, where sports betting has been legalized, what are some of the lessons that have been learned, the key lessons, either things that we would want to double down on here or things that we would potentially want to avoid? Thank you. Well, I'll start. Um, we have taken quite a bit of time to study the regulated markets around the world. And as I mentioned earlier, the one uh, comment that I heard uh, in meeting with all of these different regulators from around the world is transparency. It is if you want to have responsible legislation, and look, we have the opportunity right now in, in, in Connecticut and in every other state that's considering legislation to have a clean slate, a blank page to create the very best, most robust uh, sports betting legislation and regulation in the world. And first and foremost, there needs to be transparency and sharing of information between the operators, the regulators, and the leagues so that uh, in one day, integrity won't be an issue. And we do need to root out the black market uh, to the best of our ability and that, it, that you know, that's, that's another key element uh, to this. But if you look at some of those international markets, yeah. 
create a good regulation uh, helps bring everything into the light and eventually does eliminate black markets. I'll, I'll throw in there, uh, great question, thank you. Um, I think one of the, the key uh, lessons learned out there is you don't want to oversaturate your marketplace uh, with too many options. It allows for gray market operators to come in to confuse the market to, uh, to try to operate illegally. Certainly there's protections in place both on the state level and the, the federal uh, statutory schemes, a Wire Act, Travel Act, UEGA, et cetera. But, uh, the offshore operators don't always uh, abide by those laws. So you want to have a, a very clean uh, operating system out there with, with operators that are uh, licensed by the state. It's known to the consumers. And the second point there is that you don't want to overtax or overregulate your operators in the state. Uh, whereby if you do so, it affects the pricing of the bet. So that's another uh, component of sports betting that, that has to be considered by the operators is, is how do you create a competitive marketplace? How do you offer uh, the right mix of, of risk reward, et cetera, to your players? So if an operator is saddled with too big a burden as far as paying too big a percentage of their profits or their gaming revenues, it makes it so they can't compete and can't put out an offering that competes with the black market guys. Because remember, they're not paying taxes, they are not paying an employee's pension, they're not funding an office uh, in New Haven, they're, they're just collecting. So they'll beat you every time on pricing uh, and it'll be a race to the bottom there. So I think out, out the gate, excuse the, the pun, is that you want to make sure that you have a competitive offering that can not attack the black market, but you want to try to capture it and bring it over. So, so I cited 600 million in our projections, we're not thinking that year one our book is going to be $600 million. It'll be some fractional percentage of that, and it'll grow, because out in the, in the marketplace now, there's guys that would like to have a sports bet, but they don't want to go and send money offshore. They don't want to do it illegally, and they just say, oh, forget it, and they're not going to deal with their local bookie. So they're just not in the marketplace now. So the marketplace is bigger than the $600 million. And likewise, the, the guys that are betting now out there uh, they have accounts established already. They're comfortable with the, the offshore operators. So we're not going to capture them by saying, oh, we're legal here in Connecticut. So it, it's, it's a sensitive uh, balance and mixture. Uh, so the pricing has to be right. It can't be overburdened. It can't be overtaxed. Uh, and you don't want an oversaturated market. I have a question. If the state, uh, individual states, develop their gambling laws. How do you, if we move to have a mobile platform, how do you allow for somebody that's visiting the state or here on a temporary basis, say you have a college student that's going to school uh, here in Connecticut and wants to open up an account, but maybe their phone or their mobile device is registered in another state. How, what kind of technology could you explain how that works? Sure, and, and both DraftKings and FanDuel are doing this in the fantasy sports world right now. So. Just like many other laws, the, the law varies from state to state, and we have geolocation on our devices, and the, the laws and regulations are applied on a state-by-state -state basis. So if you, if you were to travel to New Jersey right now, while you were in New Jersey, you could open an account on FanDuel, you could make a deposit, you could place a wager. When you leave and come back to Connecticut, you can no longer place any more wagers or make any more deposits. So I think we'll, we'll be able to do that pretty, pretty easily because we've been building out that system for fantasy sports for quite a while. Yeah, the phone's pretty good at knowing where you are. We use that for media as well, so you can only watch the out-of-market games where you are. But the, the GPS and the phone that you guys, you know, take advantage of the location services. So you must have your GPS uh, monitoring on on your phone. That sure. So in order to yeah, you have to have location have services on in order to place the bet or, or make the deposit. Yeah. And if, if we cannot affirmatively confirm you're in a jurisdiction that's permissible, then you're not allowed to wager. Oh, did, if I could just uh, supplement that as well, the, um, I believe in one of the, the variations of the bills that were presented in the, the last session, there was a requirement that the, uh, the person placing the wager have an account or present themselves uh, within a physical facility, present proof of uh, age, uh, legal age to, to gamble. 
and also obviously if they're physically present in a, in a venue within state, you know that they're um, able to place that bet. As, as uh, the panelists said, there is technology out there that's pretty well settled that can geofence or geolocate so that if you are an account holder in Connecticut and you're on vacation and you want to place a wager, that's really, it gives the regulators the ability to say uh, that should be shut down. This is a technology you need to do. So again, that'll be part of the testing and, and New Jersey does that. Uh, some of the other states do as well. When they test the platforms that the operators are putting out there, they can verify and confirm that they have the appropriate restrictions on there. But it's doable is, is the answer. I should have mentioned in, in my opening comments, and I forgot, and it's, it's really a, a big piece of sports betting. You know, I mentioned and talked about revenue, but the most, the second most important part of a sports betting bill that we need to address in drafting a bill is regulation. It's so important that we have the proper regulations in place before a sports betting uh, bill uh, goes online. And what would that regulation look like? Um, do we establish a commission, an overall gaming commission? Do we use our, our existing regulators, DCP? Um, because if we take a step back and think, who are we competing against? <laughs> we're competing against the underworld, right? It's a $200 billion industry that we're competing. So it's very important that as much as we talk about the benefits of revenue, that we have the proper regulations in place and what that model might look like. I do have a question um, for our, our major league uh, sports teams. The most pushback that I have received in, in um, the conversation relative to sports betting is the integrity fee or the notion that um, the leagues would profit off of the, of the betting. We would send a piece of those profits to the leagues. And they certainly articulated um, why that they feel the integrity fees are important for the integrities of the game. But the pushback that I receive is that just by virtue of passing a sports betting bill, the leagues will profit. Um, so my question is, can you identify what additional revenue streams that if a sports betting bill is passed here in Connecticut that will bring to the leagues and what the value of, of um, having those integrity fees in you know the sports betting mm -hmm. um, whether it's through arena advertising or, or some other uh, revenue streams that you've identified and the reason why the question was asked and I, I do get this a lot is that um, when sports betting first uh, when the Supreme Court ruled on it and legalized it one of the first things a, a, an NBA, NBA owner said that just by virtue of the Supreme Court ruling and legalizing sports betting in Connecticut, that it doubled his franchise. So some people see that um, the leagues will prosper in many ways, and why the integrity fee? Sure, so I'll start, yeah. and you can add a little bit. Um, it's, it's a fair question, and I think there's definitely a lot of misinformation and misunderstanding of what we're looking to do. Um, one, integrity fee was sort of a misnomer, not something that it really, really should have been called. Um, you know, but at the end of the day, we, we do feel that we'll all be better off if the leagues are involved. Um, w one of the things that the gentleman from Sportech said that, that struck me as interesting is that he felt that the operators were taking all the risk and, you know, that, that it's the revenue is, is based on the risk and, and, you know, why should they sort of share that with the leagues? I guess we see it a, a little bit differently in that, you know, if you guys are take the position that that Sportex, getting that right, mm -hmm. that you're going to grant a license to Sportech to participate in sports betting, there's not a lot of risk that they'll make money. I mean, nobody who's been in the sports betting space uh, in any way has really lost money. Yes, there's risk on every individual bet, but if you run a book properly, you're going to make money over, over a period of time. The risk, we feel, does come on us for, for the reasons I sort of talked about earlier, that you are now having your, your average fan take bets or place bets on our sporting event. And there are a lot of things that, again, we need to make sure are done properly 
so that people do continue to enjoy the sports that they love. And, you know, if the risk that they're taking on whether the Red Sox are going to win or the Yankees are going to win, they're going to bounce their book right. But it, if we start having a situation where umpires are getting, you know, ridiculed for, I can't believe that, he, he, he called that a ball, clearly it was a strike. He must have had money on the game. I mean, there's, there's just issues that are going to affect the game that we need to protect. I'm not saying that the money that we get from the, you know, the fee is what, you know, we need that money to protect the game. We're going to protect the game regardless, but we're the ones taking real risk in sports betting coming. Um, again, as I said before, we do see it as a partnership, and I know this isn't exactly what you asked, but, but I'll get to that also, is that um, your question, I think, about what has been done in other jurisdictions and whether it's been good or not. I mean, if you look at Nevada, it, it's been sort of out there on an island and and sports betting you know for football it's fine i guess there are things that work for baseball it's not interesting you go to a nevada sports book and there it's not a good interesting uh experience with baseball and i think there's a lot more than com that can be done there if we were involved and if we were part of the partnership of doing it i think Major League Baseball brings a lot more to the sports betting market and can help increase the revenue and increase the games that are available than any individual, you know, casino or, or technology company. DraftKings and FanDuel, I think, actually, in New Jersey, have done a great job with their mobile apps. And, you know, it's, it's early days, so I think there's a lot more we can do should we decide to, you know, invest our resources in New Jersey, which I don't know where we stand on that yet. Um, but you know they've sort of just begun the process of building these games, and I think there's a lot more than that that can be done with our assets, with our intellectual property, with our marks and logos, with our data, with the data that we can make available, with the video that we can make available to tie it all together, and you can have a real robust market where there will be significantly more revenue with our involvement. Or you can take the position, we don't want to give the leagues any more money. We don't want to give them integrity fees. Okay, have a sports betting market like Nevada. It won't be that interesting. Um, I think if we're in this together, we can make a lot more money together for the state of Connecticut for Major League Baseball. I mean, I'm not being shy about the fact that if we're involved, it's we're, we're an economic interest. So I believe is SB Tech, or, uh, sorry, Sport Tech. I don't think they're a charity that's doing it on your behalf. I think they're doing it to make money from the margin. <clears throat> Um, so I think by working together, by all of us being involved, the, the operators, the state, and the leagues, we can make a much more robust market that we'll all thrive in. To your other question, we do really appreciate the fact that you guys have, have come to the table with us and have worked with us, and to the extent Connecticut continues to work with us if we get the bill done, we would like to, to do more in this state. I don't have unfortunately at the moment, specific examples of what Major League Baseball is going to be able to do in Connecticut tomorrow. But there are certainly things that we, we'd like to explore. And to the extent we have exhibitions, I mean, we can't, <clears throat> I just want to be realistic, I can't promise to move a Major League Baseball team to Connecticut if there's a sports betting bill. But there are events that we would like to do here. You know, um, whether there's, there's this food fest that we had in Manhattan last year that was really successful, where we had food from all 30 ballparks, where you got to taste the fried grasshopper from you know, Seattle, which is ridiculous, but people seem to like it. Um, and then, you know, obviously, clam chowder from Fenway Park and things from all over, and it sold down in two days. So we talked about bringing that to, to Connecticut and having that be something here that would, that would be of interest. Um, I know the PGA Tour already has some events here, and I'm not, not going to speak for you. I'll let you, you talk about that. And the NBA, as part of our, of our discussions, has also talked about it. So by having a framework here that works as a true partnership, it puts Connecticut more in our, in our thinking as we're planning these events. And you know we're going to commit to come here on a regular basis and meet with you guys. Um, tonight is a very, very small example of that. I'm not, I'm not you know, but, you know, you guys asked us to come, and, and we all showed up because we think this is important, and we're, we're excited about what we in Connecticut can do together to have a robust market. Yeah, I would just I would I would add, and 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 Kenny covered most of it, but I, what I would add is is yes, there are opportunities for our sports to reach larger audiences and engage fans in a different way. Uh, many of that will take quite a bit of time to develop. In the meantime, betting operators are going to be making hundreds of millions of dollars in profits immediately once betting is enabled. And 
it's a really a question of fairness. All of this money is being generated on the backs of our product and our athletes. And we don't think it's unreasonable to ask for a very, very small percentage of that, which, by the way, would not come out of any you know, percentage that would be taxed on that money. It would, be, it would be come from the operators on top of the money wagered. So uh, I, I can't think of many industries that are built entirely on the backs of another industry where that other industry doesn't participate in the economics of it. And uh, as Kenny pointed out, you know, we are taking on all the reputational risk. You don't, you don't remember who Pete Rose's bookie was, right? You remember that he was a Major League Baseball player. So there's a tremendous reputational risk that we're taking on in this. So it's really a matter of fairness. And, and yes, I think, I think all boats will rise from this activity. I have a question. So what is your opinion about allowing uh, sports betting on collegiate teams? Uh, if, is that allowed under NCAA or is that taboo? Because, um, you know, we have some very uh, um, large following on some of our sports teams here in Connecticut uh, at the college level. That's question number one. And uh, answer that and I'll follow up with the second question. If, if, if I could be heard on that one, um, that's interesting. And with specific regard to our uh, collegiate sports here in Connecticut. We've got some, some great teams. Just before I get to that, I just wanted to respond to the integrity fee issue. It's not nominal numbers that we're talking about uh, here. So for instance, in House Bill 5307, which was, was lobbied by, by certain leagues, they requested a 1% integrity fee on gross gaming revenue. So gross gaming revenue is basically we, your... We haven't been talking about a 1% fee for a long time, so it's not what's on the table. So it doesn't make sense to talk about that. Well, it, I mean, we can... Uh, let, let me finish my point and then you can jump in, but I, I want to correct what you stated. So a 1% and, or GGR integrity fee would be pr pr approximately 20% of gross profits. Okay, great. We're not and at 40% of the We'll that. take a quarter point. We're, we're not at 1%. Why so, are you talking about well, something that makes no... So now we're at quarter point, point, but it was quarter point of NGR. So again, I'm not looking to be argumentative here. I, I have a different view. I think that the league's votes are going to rise because now you have more people interested in their sports. Uh, if they're placing wagers on them, again, the risk does not come back to the league. So if there is another Pete Rose, the leagues aren't going to come to the operators and say, hey, guys, our bad, here's some money, right? It's going to be us that lose out uh, on those wagers uh, for improper play. And, and just, again, the jurisdictions that have passed sports wagering legislation, uh, I'm not aware that there are integrity fees that have been adopted. Uh, it, it doesn't seem to be something that is necessary based on the initial rollout. I'm not aware of any incidents that have happened in the absence of that, but I don't want to. I don't want to keep banging on that. But with regard to collegiate sports, it's it's a very interesting situation, right? Because UConn, let's say, they have a football game. Uh, that's going to be the market that attracts the most interest in state. So most people are going to say, "Yeah, I want to see." Uh, the game, I want to place a, a wager on it. So we talk about how do we combat the, the black market, how do we make sure that we're capturing that and keeping the revenues in state, well then the answer would be you should allow it. But then of course there's the other side of that argument and, and there's no right answer there where they say well we don't want sports betting on our, on our college kids in state. So other states have gotten creative with that solution. Uh, California had a uh, a draft that uh, there could be no betting on <coughs> California teams or collegiate teams playing within the state to try to give those those safeguards. You could you could parse that up and go a different way that there could be no betting on uh, on UConn games in state. Maybe you could do it out of state or at tournaments. Um, but that's a, a perfect example of where the legislature can determine what's right for Connecticut, what's going to you know have the right pulse for what's offered here. Uh, but that's one of the, the trickiest scenarios is what do you do with the collegiate sports because there's a demand But do you want to allow that in your state? So you you can bet on a UConn game or any other college game on the black market today if it comes into a regulated environment Then it will be a lot easier for operators and others to detect if something is happening if there's an irregular line movement if 
all sorts of money is coming in on one side of the bet. In Nevada, the state that's had the longest sports betting run, for a period of time, when they initially rolled out sports betting, they didn't allow it on in-state schools. They eventually changed that policy because they realized the betting was still going on on those UNLV games on the black market with bookies, with others. It made a lot more sense policy-wise to bring it out of the shadows, regulate it, and study it, and make sure nothing was inconsistent. And if it was, they could flag it quickly. And I think it's one of these instances where the goal, the policy goal, should be to stamp out the black market. It's already coming. I mean, it's already out there. Let's bring it into light. If I could just add one thing, this is this is a question uh, that has come up a lot in our discussions around the country, and what we've seen internationally is if you offer it to be bet on, people are going to bet on it, mm -hmm. and that's why when when we're talking about new sports betting legislation, we'd like that the governing bodies have some say in working with whoever the regulator is on the types of bets being offered, so that. You don't have betting markets being offered on a women's volleyball collegiate competition uh, where you might have volunteer referees or something of that nature. So if the NCAA or the universities could work with the regulators and say, okay, men's football, sure, you know, we think that these types of bets are appropriate, but we don't think that bets on this particular sport are appropriate. Those are the types of discussions I think that need to be had, and those need to be had between the regulators and the governing bodies. And that's kind of a great lead into my, my last question, because it's a, uh, you said that data integrity is one of the most important things to make sure that you're getting the data uh, from the leagues or uh, that they're representing not necessarily from folks that are, happen to be in attendance at the stadium and they didn't hear the call right or et cetera. Uh, how do you uh, regulate uh, a sport that may not have um, readily available um, data, I'm just thinking of Major League Soccer or uh, tennis, uh, some of the other leagues that they have that folks may want to bet on. Do you invite them to the table as uh, during the drafting of policy to make sure it covers the wide spectrum for whoever the operator is? Or you just, in your experience, do you set a, a standard and everybody has to step up to meet that standard? I think you can only require the use of official data to the extent that the governing body provides that official data. Um, you actually, you know, tennis actually has a pretty robust data feed that, that they do use, um, but certainly if there isn't a, a data feed that's made available by that league, then, then you can't require it. It has to be something that's made available. Um, I think a part of, I know for us and, and for the tour, making the data feed available is to make better markets too, so that you know we can do the in-game betting and we can have things in real time so that as soon as that you know ball comes off Mookie's bat and it's about to go over the wall, you know it's a home run and it's instantaneously put out into the data feed so that as the odds are changing, everybody's getting the information as soon as it happens and there's not somebody waiting to watch it off TV and to see how it goes. But if there isn't, if there's a particular sport that you know, you feel it's appropriate to offer betting on, and they're not making available a data feed. Then, you know, obviously you can't you can't require it. But for that sport, you won't have the same amount of robust markets in game because it is just not possible if they're not making the data available in real time to you, and there'll just be less revenue from that sport. But by working with us in the tour to get the data in real time, you know, as as low latency as possible, you're going to be able to offer more markets in your. In in your state so that your, your operators can have greater uptime during the game to continue to take bets and generate more revenue, which should benefit all of us. I would just add that it, it's also a role for the Department of Consumer Protection to, I, I think the legislation should be flexible enough to allow them to add sports as they review them and determine that they're reliable enough and that you can get good enough data that, that you can offer mm -hmm. bets based on them. Uh, any questions from the audience? Pat, just could you come up to the microphone because I want to be able to hear the question. Yeah, if you don't mind. Uh, 
Yes, yeah, so I think this question would be for uh, Griffin and Corey. You touched on geolocation. Um, in terms of age verification, uh, two, two things, I think. Where did New Jersey and Virgi West Virginia set uh, the age? And maybe you could just talk about um, the online age verification process that you all do. Sure. So in, in sports betting, we're seeing 21 as, as the age that's necessary. And so but both FanDuel and DraftKings have been using Know Your Customer technology. There are vendors out there who uh, have technology that uses credit bureau records and open uh, government databases in order to use information to figure out who you, that you are who you say you are and that you are of the age that you need to be in order to play on the platform. So we've been transitioning to, to using that technology on sports betting as well. Yeah, we use very similar technology uh, to FanDuel. Uh, we have all sorts of third-party providers that are licensed in New Jersey and in elsewhere. Other regulated markets that verify age, um, can flag any suspicious activity, and can escalate uh, if something seems awry. Well, I just want to take this uh, opportunity to thank the panelists for coming this evening. Thank you to First Selectman Eric Wellman for allowing us the use of the hall here in Simsbury. Uh, thank you to SCTV for taping and for all of you audience members uh, that could join us this evening. Uh, this is something that will be coming up in the next General Assembly, uh, providing that Joe and I get reelected. Uh, we will be back in on January 9th, I think, is opening day. And this is a topic that will be coming up for sure in the next General Assembly. So you have our contact information. Feel free to reach out to us. If you're very interested in attending the hearing that we have on this on that day, either testifying for or against, we're coming just to hear what these gentlemen and a lot of other people will have to say. Uh, you know, reach out to us. We'll get you on an email so you know exactly what's going to happen. But once again, thank you very much. Very informative thank tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Funding for Simsbury Community Television is provided in part by contributions from viewers like you. Thank you.